All right. Welcome back to Surf's Up, Waves All Day, um, Teacher Edition. We're going to be going over every lesson, and today we're going to be going over lesson number, whoops, lesson two, electric waves, um, which are really electromagnetic waves. Um, that's not really, that's sort of what we're talking about, but um, it's sort of a very high level view of what we're talking about today. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, today's lesson is uh, today's lesson is looking at electrical waves, and we're going to be looking at um, binary. We're going to be looking at really two different things. We're going to be looking at binary um, zeros and ones, and why computers communicate with them. And then once we look at once we're done looking at that, then we're going to look at the communication systems of of computers. The uh, the circuit boards, the CPUs, the GPUs, the various components, just at a very high level, how they all come together on a circuit board to communicate using zeros and ones and electrical waves, electricity. Um, and uh, when I talk about electricity, w that's, again, a really high level view. Um, in reality, electricity is, you know, electrical wave isn't really a thing, it's an electromagnetic wave. Um, but when we talk about circuit boards, which is what we're talking about here, we're really talking about um, voltage and current um, and how they pass through them. But that's not really, we don't need to use that language um, in the classroom or even have a deep understanding of it here. Um, it's really more about just high level idea of electrical waves, electrical waves encompassing current and voltage and how um, computers communicate with it. Um, so let's take a look at the presentation. Um, for the warm-up, we, in the lesson, got lesson plan, we have two different warm-up questions. You could ask them both or ask one. Sometimes asking one leads to the other. But the opening, one, opening question is, how do computers communicate? Um, if you ask this, kids will probably, depending on the age, certainly when I ask this with second grade classes, there's always a kid in there that knows binary or zeros and ones. Maybe they've seen it in a cartoon or TV show. Um, maybe they've, uh, maybe they've had a CS for All lesson. Um, certainly now there's lots of kids. CS for All has been very successful. And lots of kids know about binary um, and, have, and have had, you know, at the very least a code.org lesson that may, might mention it um, during like, um, week of coding or something along those lines. But most kids, most classes, there will be a kid who says, uh, yeah, um, binary, zeros and ones. Um, and, and that's a good starting point for kids to, to work from. Um, another question you can ask is, how many digits do you know? Uh, kids will say zero, one, two, three, four, five. The answer is 10. Um, hopefully, digits, not numbers. Um, and we're going to go on a bit of a tangent here. So early cu humans communicate, um, early, early humans use their fingers to communicate math concepts like numbers. And we communicate in tens because of our, sorry, I have cat scratches on my hands. Uh, cause we have, um, most people have 10 fingers. Um, and that system is called the decimal system. Uh, Deca being the, the prefix there for 10. Um, you can also call it base 10 system. Um, I, f I find calling it base 10 and base or base two for binary or we'll see other systems in a moment a bit easier because all the, the prefixes get confusing. But decimal is one that uh, most kids hear. Um, and so it's helpful to use, use that word. But uh, early humans came up with this concept because of our fingers. We've seen lots of other cultures come up with other counting systems, and we're going to go over that in just a moment. Um, our, uh, our numbers that we use in English um, come from uh, India and, um, and Arabic countries. Uh, it started, I believe, in India. Um, and so this is sort of the evolution. This image was taken from uh, Wikipedia, um, where it shows the evolution of the numbers that we use today. And our 
version of the numbers come from um, Western Arabic cultures. Uh, you can see as we get down into the as we as it evolves down here, there's sort of a branching off, and you can start to see the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, the concept of zero doesn't come until a little bit later. That's why you don't see zero here. Um, zero was a uh, was a concept, um, a mathematical concept that comes at a different point in time. So you don't see zero show up in the in the numeral systems um, just yet. Um, but it's fascinating to I think it's interesting to let kids know that different cultures um, influence other cultures, and so that a lot of our our English culture is is derived from Arabic numbers, um, and and Indian um, numbers, and so it's uh, I think important to let kids know how how the culture of science how science the culture of science can pass through cultures and influence cultures. I think a lot of it gets lost in in science curricula, and how different cultures um, influence science throughout throughout history. Um, so we're going to look at a few more number systems here before we get back to computers. Um, and binary is a number system, so it's important uh, to talk about that. Um, so decimal wasn't the only system used by humans. We'll, we're going to take a look at base 60, which is sexagesimal. Um, and that was used by Sumerians and Babylonians. Uh, we have, we're going to look at base 20, uh, vegesimal which is used by Mayans. This is why I said it's easier just to say base 60, base 20, um, base 12. I think that also helps in terms of math fluency. Um, the, the words don't really mean anything to anyone other than linguists, whereas the, the base side of it lets you understand how the system's actually working and gives kids a better understanding of, of math concepps. Um, and then we're gonna look at base 12 duodecimal, um, which is used and calculations of time, and there's actually modern uses of it as well. All right, so we've got we've got base 60. Uh, so this was used by Sumerians and then passed along to Babylonians. It's still used today. You still see its influences today. Um, and base 60 uh, is is using 60 and multiples of 60, and you see it in. Um, in in time where we have 60 seconds in a minute 60 minutes in an hour you also see it in mathematical concepts like 360 degrees in a circle um, and all of these come from the all these can be derived back to the uh, Sumerian and Babylonian usage of, of base 60 there's other cultures that use base 60 too but uh, these are the ones that are primarily talked about and probably most influential in in the usage of it. Um, there's also base 12 decimal, and the basis for base 60. I thought this was interesting. Um, and it, it comes from using the, the different b the, th the bones of your hand. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So you have 12 bones in your fingers. And then the way I've heard it described, you use your thumb to count with it, but then it turns into base 60 because you have five fingers on your other hand. So as you're counting, you do your multiples with your other hand. Um, and this is a nice example to show base 12. Um, it also shows up in time. We have 12 hours. Uh, our, our time is split into you know halves of 12 hours. Uh, it's also a multiple of, or it's a divisor uh, divisor of 60 um, but duodecimal has some modern modern um, people that try to promote it uh, there's there's in the last like 40 50 years there's been scientists who say that a base 12 system would make more sense um, and it's because 12 is the smallest multiple the smallest number with four multiples in it so you can do it by two three, four, and six. Um, and so there's, there's lots of ways to divide it. And if you look at like the weird arguments people make about this, um, 
they point out that decimals are easier. Um, like fraction, fractions are easier, not decimals, sorry, fractions are easier. It's easier to communicate fractions and um, fractions, both fractions and is like decimal fractions. It's hard to, it's hard to describe it without using the word decimal, but, um, but it's a, it's a system that, that also goes back thousands of years. Um, and other systems that exist also use body parts. Uh, there's a lot of um, number systems that come out of uh, Papua New Guinea and that sort of area where people count body parts. So they count like their fingers, their wrist, their forearm, their elbow. And so there's lots of different um, counting systems based on body part counting. Um, and another one from this hemisphere is uh, base 20, uh, which is used by, it's very famously used by Mayans. People think it comes from fingers and toes. Um, you'll see here that Mayans did have a concept of zero uh, pretty early on. And so you see zero show up there in their accounting system. Oh, let me do that. And so in Mayan artifacts and uh, you can see you can see these counting systems used. Um, they had they also had 20 day names in their calendar, so they used base 20 for for time as well, where they broke things down into groups of 20. Um, and it's uh, it shows up in lots of other other places in Mayan culture too. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of written work about this, and in the resources I have a a podcast that talks about um, some other. Um, Central South American um, counting systems. Uh, one of them uses the, I forget how to pronounce it, the QB. It's, it's um, ink and rope knots um, as a counting system. Um, so take a look at the resources to look at more counting systems. They're really interesting and great ways of infusing culture into talks about binary. Um, and anyway, back to our warm up. So so why do computers use binary zeros and ones? Do computers have fingers? You could ask kids that. Do computers have fingers? No. So what do they have to communicate with? Um, what is there that a, that a computer communi can communicate with? They don't have fingers and toes and body parts. Um, how do computers count? How did, how did humans decide computers would count a certain way? What do computers have to work with? Well, computers have electricity. Um, they have electricity flowing through them. So that leads to the question, how did you turn electricity into zeros and ones? How do you get two digits out of electricity? Um, this is a good way, f this is a good thing for students to ponder. Um, how do you get that? Well, the answer is um, electricity is part of the electromagnetic spectrum and electricity travels as a wave. And it can be measured on a circuit board with an oscilloscope, and those waves are called signals. So here's a little animation of an oscilloscope here of waves traveling through time. In reality, the waves go much faster um, through this. Uh, but this is a nice animation of how, how the waves kind of look when you measure it um, with an oscilloscope where you take wires and you touch parts of a circuit board um, to see to see um, the waves. Uh, this, in this picture, we'll, we'll go into this later, but these are analog waves here. In reality, it's digital waves, which look what they call square waves, but we'll see that in a moment. And so, back to that worm, how do we get, how do we get two digits out of electricity? Electricity travels through the wires, the traces, which we'll look at later, and circuit components. And electricity can be measured as high waves, which are measured as ones, and low waves, which are measured as zeros. Um, it's a bit more complicated than this. It's not quite high waves and low waves or big waves and small waves, but this is, a, I think, an appropriate level for elementary school students to understand this area. And this area is called signal analysis because the waves are called signals. Um, and, but I think this is a, 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 an acceptable level for kids to understand um, signal analysis where you have low waves and high waves or big waves and small waves, depending on how you want to teach it to them or talk about it. Um, and so 
the wave signals sometimes go by other names. Um, wait, did I? Oh, I guess I didn't. I didn't put it in the slide properly. But the high waves are measured as ones. So the low waves are zeros. <laughs> and sometimes the signals uh, go by other names. Zeros can be called off. Uh, ones can be called on. Um, it really depends on like what kind of work you're doing, or you might consider it off and on. Um, but certainly, uh, that's another way to look at off or on. Or if you're programming, like, and you have bits, a zero and one might be, a one might be true, or zero might be false, um, which happens in, in programming languages, uh, especially C-based programming languages. Um, so true and false is another way to look at it, on and off, uh, zeros and ones. As I was saying, so these pictures here of these, what are really, these are just like sine waves, like a mathematical sine wave that's been graphed. But uh, this is what analog waves look like. Analog waves are just like basically raw electricity um, as opposed to digital waves, which are how computers really communicate nowadays. Um, and digital waves are what they call square, square waves. So there's a distinct, you know, peak and peak and trough, I guess, a top and a bottom. Um, and uh, let me see if I, can, if I can show this here. So imagine this is breaking up in increments here. Each one of these is an increment. And so you see this would be 1, let me zoom in, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Like you, you see how it's flipping up, down, up, down. And so this is, actually, I don't think, I didn't do that actually properly. I was looking at the middle, not the line. The line is where you want to measure it. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. And so anyway, this is how computers communicate. They just, they're just shooting out electrical waves, um, these signals that are flipping high and low, up and down, and, um, and that's binary. This is, how, this is how it actually looks when you measure it on an oscilloscope. It's, it's what they call square waves again, and it goes up and down, um, and you look at it as, as like increments. Um, and this is important to... What do I want to say about this? Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with electricity. We'll talk about this uh, in the extensions for this. Not doing their job. And you get a surge, and this might mess up the bits and throw your computer off, and it'll make it crash or something, uh, or it'll make you store the wrong data. Um, or we'll see in the extensions you can get, because this is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, you can get cosmic rays that can zap your computer and flip these bits and cause problems, um, which is a real thing that happens. Uh, if you've ever, if you're more of like a tech gearhead type person, you probably heard of like shielded cables and stuff like that. Shielding ca shielded cables are trying to prevent interference with the electrical signals that travel through the electricity. Um, if you work, if, if, if you have a job in like a research lab, like you're doing EEG, where you're using electrical signals to measure brain waves, um, you have to use special um, power components that what they call clean the, clean the power because uh, you have dirty power and it's you get these like big surge protectors that you plug your power into and it enforces a very strict um, power level uh, current and voltage so that the, the, the sine waves are very the, the sine waves and the square sine waves are very clear and very clean clean um, so that doesn't get mixed up at all so that everything is calculated perfectly um, and there's no minute uh, surges or anything like that um, especially in research where you're doing stuff like brainwave measuring because you don't want to have tiny spikes that throw off your data um, they also do this in in music recording studios uh, where it's important to have like clear recordings of, wha of what you, you don't want tiny little blips and beeps in your audio like even fractional like 
fractions of a second bleeps because of some sort of spike in the power. Um, so you have you have um, special surge protectors that clean the energy and and make it conform to a specific um, wave pattern so that it doesn't cause any any weird blips and beeps in your in your recordings. Um, Recording audio is the hardest thing ever. <laughs> uh, back in the day, um, when I say back in the day, I mean like the 70s, 80s, 90s. You used to have to have like an electrical engineering degree to really be like a, a sound engineer in a studio because you had to be able to like fix the equipment and figure out what was happening with the equipment. But nowadays, everything is digital. It's not analog anymore. Everything's digital. And so it's like it's more computer based. And so you don't need to know like how to f you don't need to know as much how to fix it but there's plenty of people who you know make their own guitar amps and uh distortion pedals and stuff like that that do have electrical engineering degrees so they know what they're doing to the to the sound waves that we'll talk about next week um coming out of a recording studio anyway back to the topic at hand um so we're talking about zeros and ones, these little waves here. And there's thousands, tens of thousands of these waves, you know, shooting through your computer uh, every second. And not much can be done with a single zero or one. It's just called a bit, a bit of data. Um, this is an important vocab word, a bit of data. Just a zero or a one. Not a lot going on there, not a lot you can do with it. Um, but bits are grouped into sets of eight, um, called a byte. So now you have a byte, which is still not a lot. A byte's not a lot, um, but you can do something with a byte. Uh, a byte of data um, can, can be a row of lights on a micro bit. Um, eight bytes of data can be the whole micro bit. If you've used micro bits before, um, the whole array of LEDs on a micro bit. Um, and and uh, the those are my special guests for later. Uh, and so bytes, but bytes still aren't really a lot. Um, half a byte is called a nibble. Um, I know I remember learning that in high school, and someone reminded me of it recently. Um, it's not really. I wouldn't say something that a computer scientist really talks about nibbles at all. Um, but we do work in, in, in bytes. Um, bytes are important, especially when you're doing like um, reverse engineering or packet analysis or signal analysis where you're really looking at, at bytes of data. Uh, uh, or if you're trying to modify old game systems or modeled games, bytes of data are important too. But, but really, these days we're dealing in megabytes and kilobytes, not even or sorry, megabytes and gigabytes. We're not even really dealing with kilobytes anymore. Um, kilobytes of data are not really that much either, um, unless you're working with, working with retro equipment or doing like very low level stuff on a computer. Most of the time we're dealing with megabytes and gigabytes. Uh, a megabyte is a million bytes, and a gigabyte is a billion bytes. Um, there's also terabytes, which are a trillion bytes. Um, but normal people don't really deal with terabytes, I guess if you've got like a giant Dropbox account or something. Um, but most of the time, there's no cloud, there's no, actually, I think Dropbox will sell you two terabytes of cloud storage. Um, but most people aren't dealing in, in terabytes of data. Businesses do, but not most people, um, unless you're like recording videos and stuff like that, and like you got your own hobby video production. Then you might be dealing in terabytes of data, but most people are dealing in gigabytes and megabytes. Um, a photo posted to, social to a social network is around three megabytes. Like if you're posting a, a photo to Instagram, it's somewhere between like two and eight megabytes depending on what you're doing. A camera phone photo, like if you take a picture with an iPhone um, and you send it to someone, it's probably going to be around eight to 12 megabytes. But uh, depending on what the photo's of, because compression can, can reduce that. Um, but Three megabytes, I think, is a is a good is a good estimate for what a typical photo to social media is. Um, if you're posting a video, that's larger, obviously. 
Um, videos can be anywhere between like also three megabytes. Uh, it could be like a very well compressed video, but they're usually I would say around 10 to 10 to 20 at the, at the minimum megabytes, um, depending on, on how it's compressed, how they reduce the data when they send it to you. Um, sort of like the difference between like high def and SD and HD and 4K video, like social media compresses a lot of that um, so that they're not sitting around too much. But it's still, let's just say under, if you're sending a video on TikTok or something, posting a video to TikTok is probably still under 50 megabytes. Um, now, when we start looking at streaming movies, like on Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever, um, a typical streaming movie is well over three gigabytes. Um, if you're looking at HD, it's it's over three gigabytes. If you're looking at like 4K video, that's in like the the 10 10 plus gigabytes area. Um, and um, and so that's a that's these are good numbers to give kids to really think about how much they're dealing with um, when they when they talk about data. Uh, but going back to retro games and bringing this back a bit, um, the original Pac-Man game, arcade game, was 26 kilobytes, which is like this video of Pac-Man here. This video of Pac-Man here. This video of Pac-Man here is, is, uh, is much, much, much larger than 26 kilobytes. Probably the JPEG image is probably close to 26 kilobytes um, for various reasons, even though this is a game from forever ago. You can still have an image that's more representative of, of that's larger than the actual data the game required. Um, and the home version of Pac-Man was only four kilobytes. Four kilobytes is like, that's practically nothing. Um, and that four kilobytes, that 4,000 bytes, uh, needed to store everything for the game. The graphics, the sound effects, the music, and the code. All of that in four kilobytes. So you had to cut lots of corners um, so that you could uh, store everything into that, into that cartridge. Four kilobytes, not a lot. Um, and so sometimes they have to reduce the sound effects, uh, reduce the, the, the sprites, the, the way the pixels looked. Um, they would uh, at take, a, take out background music or reduce the samples for it, although samples don't really come into play in, in 70s, and 80s, 70s and early 80s video games. But once you get to Nintendo, they start sampling things, um, sampling like sound effects and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, 26 kilobytes of data to make all of Pac-Man. Like we, we waste 26 kilobytes on our hard drive based, uh, based on how hard drives work. We're wasting that, that amount just in like, in just like the way data is written um, to a hard drive and just like unused blocks when we have to, you know, write data to our hard drives. Like kilobytes, um, I think I read that every, I forget the statistics, but it's, it's something ridiculous. Like every Nintendo game ever made and every Super Nintendo game ever made can like fit on like a CD drive or some, one, one CD-ROM, um, which is only like 700 megabytes. And all those, all those, you know, hundreds if not thousands of, well, probably thousands of games fit into like one, the fraction of one like CD-ROM. Um, which is pretty crazy, uh, the how much how much they did with with how little with how little data. Uh, I think that's true for NES games, not Super Nintendo games. Now that I'm saying this out loud, uh, I definitely don't have a citation for that, but it's it's something like that. Um, anyway, modern video games are well over one gigabyte. Oops, let me bring my picture back up. Modern game video games are well over one gigabyte. If you're playing a game on Xbox, PlayStation, Switch. Um, maybe a mobile device, uh, or, or maybe on a PC using Steam or, or something like that. Most, many modern video games are well over a gigabyte. Not all of them. Like, obviously, stuff on, like, uh, on, like, an iPhone or an Android phone aren't typically over a gigabyte, but definitely, like, if 
you're playing like a, a shooter game or an RPG or something with like modern assets, like modern modern graphics and you know big open worlds. They have lots of textures. Textures are the are the way that the ways that things are painted in the game. They have lots of textures, and those take up a lot of space. Uh, and especially if you're doing doing like 4K gaming, which takes up even more. Um, there's PlayStation games that don't even fit on Blu-ray discs anymore. And Blu-ray discs can hold gigabytes and gigabytes of data. Um, so even if you buy the disc, you still have to download the the asset pack to to play the game. Um, is there more here? Yeah, I was playing, uh, or I was trying to play Microsoft Flight Simulator uh, a couple weeks ago, and to even just like play the game, you have to download like what was it? 80 or like 110 gigabytes of data just to like just like basic like I want to play the game they've got so many assets in there so many world terrains that there's just too much there's so much data to download and I was just like ah forget it I'm gonna play something else um, but lots of games eat up lots of data and it's all because of the textures the the amount of artwork in there um, I talked about last week how there is a lot of writing in video games video games aren't just made of code, they're made of dialogue. Well, today I'm gonna tell you video games are also made with lots of artists. Um, artists have to make video games. Uh, creative writers write the video games. Artists design all those 3D models and also the, the textures on those 3D models. And it's, uh, it's one of the most important things for video games because someone wants to look at cool special effects, they need fancy fancy graphics for that and they need artists to, to draw those graphics and paint those textures and draw those textures. All right, so this is in the presentation where we do a bit of a break. Um, if you're gonna split this across days, you this would be a, a good spot to break at um, because now we're gonna go from binary into, now that we understand what binary is and signals are, now we're gonna talk about where those signals travel, which is in a circuit board. Um, and much like before, how I Went on a bit of a tangent about writing systems or number systems in base two, base 10, um, base, uh, base 20, base 60, base 12. Computers actually also work in base eight and base 16. They're called, in base eight, it's called an octet. And base, where is it? Okay. Oh, I never say base two in this whole thing. That's the slide I'm missing. Um, sorry. I need a slide that says base two. Uh, I don't. I don't get into that. Um, so anyway, computers you work in base two, but at a higher level they work in base eight, which is an octet, and they work in very frequently base sixteen, which is hexadecimal. Like when you talk about if you do like web design, and you're putting in like a color in CSS, chances are using hexadecimal for that, where it goes from zero to nine, and then it goes A B C D E F, so that. A, B, C, D, E, F is the last um, six digits of, of hexadecimal. And, um, and that's just a more compact way of communicating, of communicating numbers. It's more compact, so you don't have to have as big of a number to, to send around, and it works as a string in the programming world. Anyway, so, we ha so computers work in base 2, base 8, and base 16. Um, but kids will commonly, especially in elementary school, just focus on base two binary. Uh, oh, one more fun fact um, before I move on. When I was looking up um, what they call the Arabic Arabic numbers, but it's really Western Arabic or Hindu Arabic numbers, so it's frequently called to do. Um, so these numbers. Um, have been translated into every digital form. Um, radio, Morse code, uh, and this isn't true for most, for a lot of other number systems, but the Arabic numbers have been translated into um, virtually every, uh, every type of, of number system, or, or every type of telecommunication system. Morse code, radio, um, when you get into digital stuff, ASCII, um, ANSI, uh, these are different like character encoding, f but it's it's 
you know, made big across the digital world. I and it, it's it's anyway. It's just a it's just a, a fun fact. Um. All right. Where did we go? Okay. So now we're coming back to we're going to go move on to circuit boards. What's inside us? Um, we have different um, systems of the human body here. Maybe kids will know some of them. Older kids definitely recognize some of these systems. Um, I always like to quiz them. But we've got bones, organs, muscles, nerves, and more inside of us. Um, much like I used the writing systems as a jumping off point, the number systems as a jumping off point for um, binary, I use the human body as a jumping off point for circuit boards. And so humans have bones, organs, muscles, nerves, and more in us. And those are all organized into systems. We have the digestive system, the circulatory system, muscular, respiratory, skeletal, nervous. And all these systems are, are interconnected. When I do this presentation with middle school kids, one of them always shouts out, uh, reproductive system, uh, which didn't make it into my slide. Um, but middle schoolers are always on it. Anyway. Um, so once we've looked at humans, now what's inside the computer? Like this game console here, Nintendo Switch. We can pop it open and start taking a look. Um, every computer has at least one circuit board inside of it. Um, portable, portable systems have lots of circuit boards, especially the Switch where they're trying to make it compact. You want it to fit in as tightly as possible. It might have multiple layered circuit boards. Um, the Switch is definitely has some interesting shapes and shapes to their circuit boards for sure but phones you know the circuit boards inside phones basically look like the phone minus the cutout for the battery um, every computer has at least one circuit board in it though uh, and every electronic gadget has a circuit board inside of it too pretty much everything electronic has a circuit board in it it's important for kids to think about this if you search for if you have any gadget and you search for um, you know, that gadget's named Teardown. You'll probably find someone taking it apart, whether it's a video or high-res photos. iFixit has lots of pictures of, of these teardowns. Um, but they're really interesting, I think, for kids to see and adults to see, too. And it's helpful if you want to fix your own stuff to see how it, how it, what it looks like on the inside and how it needs to be put back together when you're taking it apart. I actually have a, a, uh, a Nintendo Switch controller here that I was modifying and I put a new case on it so you could see through the case and I messed up putting it back together so I have to take it apart and figure out there's some wire that got unplugged and I have to plug it back in I have to take the whole thing apart and figure out which wire it was I know a button doesn't work so I think I can figure it out anyway and so circuit boards are made up of parts often called components um, those components can be microchips capacitors resistors diodes Microchips is sort of a catch-all for CPUs, microprocessors, but also like integrated circuits. Integrated circuits are these, these things down here. Like the, you can also call them microchips, but they're often just called ICs or integrated circuits, which have like big, tiny circuits inside of them. So it's got, it's got diodes, transistors, and other parts inside of it to, to make something work. Um, they're like mini, they're like mini CPUs basically. Um, and can I recognize any of these here? I don't have one of the most famous integrated circuit microchips on here. The, it's called the 555 timer. Um, it's like, you know, it powers so many devices. Like, it powers, like, lights and shoes. Because it, it's basically an integrated circuit that, that can keep a beat. It, it knows when to shoot off a timer. And so it can make things blink and do all kinds of stuff, blink to certain rhythms and stuff like that. So, so it gets used all in all sorts of places um, where you need a timer. Uh, we see LEDs on here, um, transistors. Uh, that's probably a fuse. I'm not sure what that is. Um, we have capacitors, capacitor, capacitor, capacitor. Um, what are those? Those might be little LEDs. I don't know what those are. Those might be surface-mounted LEDs. I'm not sure what those are. Or surface-mounted transistors or surface-mounted... Oh, those are probably surface-mounted resistors now that I see it. Uh, 
These are resistors right here. Um, so there's different different components that make up a circuit board. Um, these are all like older ones, so they don't really match up with what we see on on a switch circuit board. But if you look at a, circ a switch circuit board, you can see the different microchips here. You see these things, which are probably transistors or uh, resistors. Sometimes there, there's fuses in here for power protection. Um, that's a little connect. These are different connectors to connect to the other circuit boards. Um, anyway, let's move on. Here we have, uh, so we just want to let kids know every gadget has a circuit board inside of it. We already saw that. So the components are connected by wires printed onto the board, onto the board on the board. That's a bit redundant there. But you can see in this picture, whoa, that's extra zoomed in. These little, like, they look like road pathways, but these are what they call traces. So these traces connect to different areas. And if you had an oscilloscope, you could you know, take the tip of the oscilloscope and put it on top of these traces and it would start picking up signals on them. And this is how a lot of um, reverse engineering like hacker types um, reverse engineer consoles and figure out how to modify them and stuff like that. Uh, let's see. So we have traces, you know, going all throughout the circuit board, um, connecting all the various components. Um, when you open up a circuit board, and you start messing with it and soldering things onto it, it's really important not to mess up the traces. Like this is a common thing that happens when people who are inexperienced try to modify their circuit boards. They they burn through a trace or something like that. Like I remember when I was a teenager, mod chips, the Playstations and Dreamcast. And if you, you know, don't have your your soldering iron at the right temperature, you can easily burn through a trace and mess up the whole board and have to like, you know, try to get that trace connected again. Um, and so electricity flows through these traces to all the components, which I think I already mentioned. Um, much like the human body, circuit boards are made up of interconnected systems too. So in these, uh, these red rectangles here, or these, these colored rectangles here are pointing at different like systems and circuit or uh, microchips of the of the switch. And so there's audio systems, graphic systems, there's the bus. The bus is like makes up the traces and like the systems that kind of control the traces. Like there's um what they call chipsets that kind of like make up how a bus communicates. Um and there's more. There's so along with the audio and the graphics and the regular process the regular CPU, there's also like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth systems. There's um, in the switch, there's an RFID system. Um, there's lots of things going on in devices that we, uh, we don't really think about. And so here is the CPU of the switch. Um, they use an NVIDIA CPU, which they, they make graphic, graphic cards. <laughs> Sorry. And so this, you can see lots of traces coming in and out of this because this is a CPU and it has to communicate with lots of systems. Um, and CPUs always have, you know, who makes them, the model, usually a serial number. CPUs also get hot. Not really the, the switch CP, the switch, the switch processor doesn't get that hot. Um, but they always have cooling on them. Like you can, you can hear a fan on the switch. They always have like a heat sink on top of them. So if, when you look at pictures, you don't always see the CPU because they have a they have a fan or a heat sink on top of it. Here we have, I think these are the these are the memory, like the 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 storage for the switch. I might be wrong though. I forget the exact layout. And this is the Wi-Fi area over here, uh, if I'm remembering right. Um, but anyway, there's different subsystems of the of the switch. Um, and every every computer has different systems on it. Um, if you look at a, if you look at pictures of motherboards, um, if you look at pictures of motherboards online, you can you can see the different subsystems on there too. Okay. Um, oh yeah, 
Sorry, I already I zoomed in on the microchip. Microchip most important of the uh, of the board, and um, and many systems are built around the microchips. Uh, so we have different microchips in here too. Like I said, the the Bluetooth, the Bluetooth, the wireless, or the Wi-Fi, not the wireless, the Wi-Fi, the <laughs> the Bluetooth, the RFID, the audio processor. There's different there's different processors in here, and they all have systems kind of built around them that then get connected back together. Microchips are made up of silicon, a common element with conductive properties. It's important mm -hmm. to note this is silicon, not silicone. Silicone makes up like medical implants, but also um, like kitchenware. Silicone has an E at the end. Silicon mm -hmm. is, they're obviously related, but silicon is the thing that makes up um, technology parts, Silicon Valley. Uh, and silicon is one of the most common substances on Earth. Um, it's found in sand. Um, when it's in its pure form, it's like a shiny rock, but you <coughs> also in, in, in sand. Sand is made up of silica, which has silicon in it. Um, and silicon makes up CPUs, GPUs, um, that's graphic processors. It makes up RAM, which is like fast temporary memory. It makes up SSDs, which stands for solid store devices um, or solid state devices, uh, which is a storage mechanism. Um, and they're all made up of microchips made of silicon. Uh, silicon has a, do I talk about this? So silicon is a semiconductor and has conductive properties that make it suitable for being used as CPUs. Um, it goes through a fabrication process where they use um, a process called lithography, which is kind of like, um, I don't know too much about that, but it involves lasers and acid and stuff like that, it's chemicals. When you, if you grew up in the 90s, you probably remember those clean room photo video commercials of Intel where they had like the Intel bunnies of the guys in like the clean suits um, and they would be jumping around and, and silicon, as it's being fabricated, it can't get dust or anything on it. So there's this, this chemical process that it needs to have done to it to turn it into chips and wafers uh, where it gets the, the transistors that make them up imprinted onto them. And so it needs to be done in a clean environment with uh, a very specific process uh, to do that. Um, I'll add a link to the resource that explains that if anyone is interested in learning more um, on how, how a CPU is made. Anyway, so the GPU, CPU, SSD, RAM, and more use electrical waves to communicate in binary, bringing this all back together. The electrical waves send signals between the systems and components to communicate. And the conductive property of silicon keeps this signal going. Um, it, it's a semiconductor, so it has a conductive property that, that, that doesn't have too much resistance, but it has the right amount of resistance and, and conductivity to allow the signal to propagate and transfer through the system without diminishing. And that's, that's, the, that's the, the lesson. Um, it's a lot. So again, in case it wasn't clear, these should always be broken up into smaller amounts. Uh, take away what you want. If you want to just talk about silicon, maybe you want to do that in circuit boards. Uh, if you want to talk about number systems and focus more on binary, and maybe you want to do a whole social studies lesson on different counting systems, that's also possible too. Uh, and you can just focus on binary and different counting systems humans have um, and make it more of a social studies lesson if you want. Um, there are, let's see. So we're moving on to our lesson projects now. Um, and we're going to demo one here for you. Uh, the lesson projects, two of them are, are two lesson projects that if you're a CS for All, Step Junior, um, cohort teacher, you've probably seen these before. Um, where one is based off of the not a box activity where you can design a video, ga a video game console. Again, this all depends on how you want to do the unit project, but you can design a video game console using not a box where kids are designing what their console would look like. What kind of, stu like if you're working based on last week, what, what kind of cartridge it's going to have and where that cartridge might go. 
um, you know, ports to hook up the, the controllers if you want. Really, it's a, it's a design activity to talk about what it might look like and what kind of features it might have. Um, you could also just do a design, design a video game console using artwork where you're just drawing up pictures of it and having kids design their own consoles using pictures. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, a big craft activity. It could just be a drawing activity where they're working more on blueprints. And this integrates well. We did this with our, with our museum <laughs> gallery where we had, uh, we added the pictures to our, our gallery. Um, you could also do create a craft circuit board. Uh, and this is a craft computing activity. Um, there's pictures of these in the, in the resources for the unit. Uh, you can take a look at that. And then we also have a new activity um, around uh, creating a, basically you're fabricating a circuit board or a chip, uh, trying to go through the fabrication process. In this fabrication process, we're gonna use heat and um, shrinky dink or circuit paper. And Yadira is getting ready to demo that now. All right, we'll do a little switcheroo. All right. Okay, thanks. <coughs> All right, thanks, Galen. All right, now time for a quick um, switch up. So, as Galen mentioned, um, you know, we've done different variations of the um, of circuit board fabrication, <coughs> anywhere from using uh, green cardstock with uh, yellow yarn to um, you know cardstock with sand or puff paint, um, and or even like foam stickers. Um, I have I, I feel that over the years I've learned that you know when you're working with specifically kids can't really go into those intricacies like the really understanding the just the behind the traces on a circuit board and um, so I think recently I came across um, a scientist who was uh, amazing stuff with nanotech and um, and I thought wow this could be uh, a great way to integrate it in the circuit board making because we can really think about how to turn something large scale into something small um, so today's activity is a nano circuit board. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you what you're going to need um, for today's project. You're going to need some of this awesome shrink wrap paper. Now I found this um, at a bodega for like 99 cents a while ago. Um, but it's a bit of a hit and miss product. Um, you know, I went back to the same bodega and I couldn't find it. <laughs> so, um, but you can find this at a craft store. Um, in any case, there's, it usually comes in a huge sheet. So um, I used one whole packet for, I think, about four, four or five classes. So it goes a long way. Um, I went ahead and pre-cut a few of these um, pieces so you can see the dimensions here. Um, so this is about five or six inches by five or six inches. Um, you'll need a permanent marker, and I'll talk a little bit about traces in just a moment when we get started. And then you're going to need a circuit board template. Um, this one's a little bit more detailed, and that's okay. Um, uh, you can maybe make it a little bit easier depending on what grade or the ability of your students, but um, just kind of randomly picked this one. I also want to point out if you want to think about the specific components of an integrated system, this is a great way to practice that knowledge by um, selecting a template that might have those components so that it's more practice and application or, or making that connection to those components to, in relation to the circuit board. All right, <clears throat> so here's a quick sample. Okay, so this is where what we're aiming for right now. Oh, and of course, I forgot, as Galen mentioned, we're going to need a heat source. So I have this little teeny tiny <laughs> hair dryer that you can use. Um, but you could also use other heat sources. You just have to be extra careful. Of course, in a classroom, this is a perfectly safe option. You know we're going to turn it on so I can adjust the 
audio, so it's not like. Oh yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, it's gonna get loud for a moment there. Okay, so this is our goal to achieve that. We're gonna go ahead and take a pre-cut piece of the shrink wrap paper, and I'm just gonna do this part of it. Now I chose a fine point sharpie, but um, I think in regards to the importance of traces on a circuit board, thickness matters. It's absolutely pertinent to how things function. So the thicker the trace, the, the more reliable uh, it is for moving the electrical current to the different components. So um, in any case, I'm going to go ahead and use the fine point, but um, you know, in a classroom, you could use, say, a, like a thicker marker, like a, a Crayola washable. Um, but I would say definitely go with a dark color um, because it will, it may fade a bit when you apply the heat source. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to go ahead and start with the microchip in the kind of onto the center here, off the center. And I'm going to go as fast as I can so that you can see. Now, I would say in, when I tested this several times in the classroom, there was, um, you know, students could, would take anywhere to, I mean, from five minutes to like 15 minutes. Again, depending on the template that they use. In one class, they designed their own circuits, um, kind of based on their own stories, which I thought was a really creative way um, to incorporate circuit boards and storytelling. Now. Going back to the idea of traces, the thicker the better. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, <laughs> obviously, I'm, as I'm showing you, not <laughs> uh, not to be neat here. Um, I'm just going to try to go a little thick here because as it shrinks, you'll see that those lines get smaller. Um, I will forewarn you that when you do apply it, we lose some of the smoothness because the heat it basically morphs the structure of the cellophane. And so it's, um, you know, it has nothing else, it doesn't know what else to do except for bubble along the pro its process of shrinking. So, all right, almost done here, and then we'll go ahead and test it. Just a couple more details here just so you can see where the microchip is and then how these thick traces kind of come out neat. Okay, almost there. And it's, to be honest, I feel like this is pretty therapeutic too. It's like those adult coloring books with mazes. Okay, what if I went off? Okay, so this is my sample. All right, so you tell it's, it's not very neat, but at least you can see there's some nice thick lines there, which is great. Okay, so Galen's going to adjust the sound so it's not super loud because I'm now going to apply the heat. Um, just a quick word. Uh, for quick results, uh, you could go ahead and use high, uh, the high setting. Um, if you want to keep it a little bit smoother, you could do low, but it's going to take a lot longer and the results vary quite a bit from what I've noticed. So we're just going to go for it. Um, we anticipate it will be a little bumpy, but we're going to try. Okay. Sound technician, ready? All right. I'm just going to anchor it down with my finger as it... I didn't think this out. <coughs> I should have removed the other pieces of cellophane and paper. <laughs> Let me weigh some of this down.
you can already see some of the shrinking. Oh, my face is on fire. <laughs> What? Oh. There's a little bit more. Sorry, guys. Let me... Oops. I'm going to try to keep it centered here. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there <coughs> because you can, you can see some shrinking already happening, but I don't want to completely um, compromise like the integrity. You can still see um, some of those thick lines have, are now closer together. So as I mentioned, it, do, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, you can still see those lines, um, uh, the traces shrink a little bit closer. So the effect looks a little bit more accurate to what you would see on a uh, on a circuit board um, minus the bumpiness here uh, but that's it so uh, I would say you know if you have access to a an oven in your classroom which I doubt but if you do that's great you should definitely invest in shrinky dink paper because that's an easier I mean it, it would give you a smooth and more colorful um, uh, result but that's your nano circuit board. Um, quick within like a couple minutes that you could easily carry out in the classroom. Thanks. All right, I'll switch it back to Galen. <coughs> All right. Thank you, Yadira. Um, so that's, a, that's our fresh new activity um, that you can try out in the classroom. Um, and part of that activity is just focusing on the, on the um, idea of fabricating, um, that you're fabricating the CPU, um, you're fabricating your circuit board. It's, I think, vocabulary that, that's, that's fun and, and gives kids a bit more idea of the content of what it is involved in. Uh, and computer engineering, which is what this, this sort of field is a part of, a computer engineering or electrical engineering, where you're fabricating CPUs and working on circuit boards. It's different, for, it would be a different area than computer science, although they're typically in, uh, in universities, they're typically the same department. The, they call it EECS, electrical engineering and computer science, uh, or CECS, computer engineering and computer science. Um, anyway, let's go. Now we're going we're going long again, which wasn't my intention. Uh, we've got um, let's just take a quick look at the extensions. Um, so if you want to take this in a different direction in the classroom, you can also look at Morse code. Um, Samuel Morse wasn't a great person. He's buried here not too far from from uh, Sunset Spark HQ. Um, I want to say he was a uh, anti-abolitionist, he was pro-slavery. He's not really a great person, but he did invent Morse code, so I guess we do have to talk about him. Um, but there are, uh, there are um, Morse code, much like binary, has multiple ways of interpreting it where you can have long and short um, beeps or whatever the transmission they're called, or uh, long and short, or I forget the different ways they beep. But anyway, um, it's my notes actually. Uh, Morse code, though, is, a, is another activity. And there's some Morse code um, apps and games and lessons in the, uh, in the resource section. Um, you can also talk about magic rocks. Um, and this is sort of a material science type activity or extension. Um, we're going to see another one of these in the next lesson on sound waves about magic rocks, a different property of certain rocks. 
but I, I think it's interesting for kids to realize that CPUs are just rocks. They're just, they're just silicon taken out of sand, out of, from sand pits, and we do science to them to, to turn them into these little, they have little, you know, five nanometer, seven nanometer um, wide transistors and billions of transistors within these silicon wafers uh, that we shoot electricity into and it turns into a computer. That's crazy, that's wild, that's, that's a magic rock. And it's all part of the conductive nature. Um, so you could, if you look at the craft computing lesson that's referenced in the lesson plan, there's a longer lesson about um, silicon and where it comes from and the properties of silicon as an element um, in, the, in the craft computing unit. If you wanna, if you wanna more push that lesson or extend into that lesson, um, when you're running through, when you're running through this, or look at that and get more ideas from it. Um, another cool idea, and this drives more into the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum that a lot of our waves take place in. Again, this lesson, um, so lesson two, lesson four, which is on sound, no. Lesson four is light waves, and lesson five is radio waves, all deal with the electromagnetic spectrum. And here's an extension involving cosmic rays. Uh, that extends into the electromagnetic spectrum as well. So this talks about um, solar flares and gamma rays. And it's not really a big extension. It's just something definitely for upper grade kids. <laughs> but I have this great video, not great for the class, to show to a, cl to a class, um, but it's about, it's about 30 minutes long, so it's not great for a class. But if you watch it, you can get the idea of how, how uh, cosmic rays can affect um, computers and basically solar flares um, can cause bits to flip and if your tech isn't shielded properly it can cause weird problems to happen. In this video they talk about an election that looks like it was hacked. They talk about an airplane that crashed and I forget what the third one is but all these things that happen because of cosmic rays messing with computers. Um, and it sounds like comic book stuff like cosmic rays but this is something that I think is very relatable. Once kids understand what an electrical signal is and how CPUs use electric electrical signals to communicate, then they can learn about cosmic rays and how cosmic rays can interfere with technology. And it really, I think, broadens their horizon on what, on what science is and what science can be taught to elementary school kids. Um, and so it's a great way to talk about mysteries around debugging uh, involving rays from space. Um, and how difficult debugging can be when you have, when you're involving the entire universe. Um, and this is thing that, <laughs> this is things that, uh, um, you know, satellite developers and people who work on like the, the telescopes in the sky have to think about when they're building these, or like the different rovers and, and probes that we send into space have to think about on how computers will deal with, with the elements of space, not just the, not just the, you know, getting up into space, but actually dealing with, like the unprotected, um, with no atmosphere, uh, world of space, um, space versus a computer. Anyway, that is that is this week's lesson, lesson two. If you have any questions, you can uh, email me, um, or uh, or leave some comments. Um, everyone who's watching this probably has my contact info, so uh, send me a message if you have any questions. Um, see you next week. Next week we'll be talking about sound waves um, and looking at retro sound effects.